This is the Master Marketer Show, powered by Proofpoint Marketing. Each week, we explore the mindsets, skill sets, and tool sets the top B2B marketers use to drive results. Gain actionable insights, one masterful, revenue-generating success story at a time. Let's get started. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of the Master Marketer Show. I am excited to have this conversation because it's been a conversation I've been trying to have for, I don't know, probably what, about a year, Jamie, something like that, maybe. Uh, And here we are. This seems to be a common thread uh, lately where there's a lot of people I want to talk to and scheduling and all that fun stuff. So anyway, glad to be here. Jamie Hines, who is the CMO at Hover, and we're going to be talking about marketing leadership and Jamie, I've talked a number of times in the past, and uh, Jamie has this interesting philosophy around uh, the relationship being at the center of uh, marketing leadership. So, Jamie, I'm going to just lob it back over to you and maybe have a, start us off. What does that mean? <clears throat> All right. Um, the the relationship, and, and it's interesting, when we first talked um, and you teed up this idea, I hadn't. I hadn't thought about my kind of approach in terms of the relationship per se, but in retrospect, I, it makes makes a lot of sense. So um, my journey to marketing leader started as a sales guy and I started selling for Xerox and uh, which was a pretty interesting experience in and of itself. And then my, my goal uh, though was to, to be a, a, a product manager and, Knowing it was difficult to go from undergrad to product manager, I decided to do sales for a while and learned a ton. Um, but I became a product manager and I realized kind of a difference between salesperson is if you're a really great salesperson, the whole company will kind of do whatever you want them to do for you. Um, if you're a product manager, the whole company still has to work for you. But often they're not as motivated to do everything you need them to do. It's, you know, all matrix management and, and stuff. So um, at that point, it it dawned on me that diplomacy was 80% of the battle. And um, I adopted what I called the, uh, the Tom Sawyer approach to uh, product management, which was, hey, everybody, whitewashing this fence is so much fun. You want to join? And... You know, it's smiling and friendliness and, and you know, genuine authenticity. Um, but at, at any rate, um, from that point forward, and that was probably the late 90s, um, it's something that I've told to people who've worked for me ad nauseum. I've told my kids ad nauseum, like they, they, no one wants to hear it anymore, but I still believe that it's really, really important to, um, you know, you, you, you get, you get more, um, flies with honey than with vinegar or whatever that old silly cliche is so yeah so that that's kind of how uh, my approach to to our relationships and in, in marketing leadership started so let's talk about the diplomacy concept maybe a little bit more in terms of um you know to me when i like to me the word diplomacy for one reason or another uh kind of the, my visceral reaction to it is like, oh, it's not authentic. Like I'm trying to con- like coerce somebody into getting what I want. Uh, that's obviously not what you're describing. So talk about that a little bit more. How, and, how, and maybe along with that, how do you get over that? Because I'm guessing I'm not the only person that thinks that way. No, fair enough. And, and that's, that's good that you brought that up. Um, I'll just give like a, a, just an example that has occurred to me over the years. Um, you've probably seen this too, especially people who are kind of newer to leadership roles. You find this phenomenon where they, they act more serious and more stern than they need to be and kind of teetering towards the not cool side of the continuum because that's what they think that being professional and being a leader and being strong and all that stuff is. Um, so I, I definitely don't want to go there. And when I'm talking about diplomacy, I'm talking about treating other people the way that you would want to be treated, really. Um, and so 
I'm, I'm, it's not the art of the deal. It's, uh, it's, Hey, I want you to win. I want me to win. Let's figure out a time frame or a schedule or a workload or whatever that's going to work for both of us. And, uh, and, and another, you know, I, I know that you talk a lot about, uh, about tool sets and mindsets and skill sets and results in here, a, uh, a tool set that, that I've found that can be real helpful here um, that, that goes back to just, just, just writing it down helps things be better is the, the old racy document, the responsible, accountable, consulted and informed kind of a thing. So when you're working with your peers or your subordinates or your bosses or whomever, if everybody knows who's responsible, accountable, consulted and informed on what it helps that diplomatic process go a lot more smoothly. Um, so you didn't ask, but I think that that can be really helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And it's in, it's interesting because so usually we do one recording a week. This just happens to be a double up one. I did one a little less than an hour ago here. And that same exact thing came up where it's uh, having that uh, roles and responsibilities really clear. Uh, and they're, they use a different, you know, because racy has what, like 25 different permutations at this point. Um, but that came up in that conversation as well. And we do it also. So we have our entire, um, uh, like all the things that our team does, each of those line items has a racy associated with it. So it's like, okay, when we're doing this deliverable, here's what that looks like. When we're doing this other deliverable, here's what that looks like, et cetera. So I, I completely agree with, with that because that is where I've seen the most sticking points is like, well, I thought you were responsible for this or, you know, the, oh, well, this isn't part of my job description or, you know, like all that kind of stuff comes out when there's not, when the definitions aren't good. Yeah. And I mean, there's that, that ties into uh, uh, spoiler alert. I, at one point in my career, I worked for a company that did business process management and uh, the, the, the process is so often overlooked in any facet of business and uh because it's not as sexy as the the technology and the other shiny objects but as i know you know when you uh when you automate something with a bad process you just break it faster so you got to get it written down yep so i'm curious again the you know what we've talked about so far in theory applies to any leadership doesn't matter which function uh, at least i would argue that um mm -hmm. Are there any differences or kind of unique attributes, if you will, to being a marketing leader uh, when it comes to diplomacy? It's a really interesting question. Um, I've never thought about it that way, but I'll give you some, and it, and it, it this you know, isn't a one size fits all, but for me, the way that I like to be a marketing leader is, um, and I guess in in the term of uh, for mindsets that marketing should be fun, um, and so I try to um, imbue that into all of the conversations that I have. Um, you know, maybe even more often than I should, but you only get to do this stuff once, and so let's let's try to have fun while we're doing it. Um, so smile, you know, make a joke. Um, we're, you know, we're not, we're not, people's lives aren't at stake if our digital advertising campaign doesn't work out quite as well as we hoped that it would and what have you. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of first. I think then from like a skill set perspective, communication is, is so important, whether it's one-on-one -on -one diplomacy, you know, um, but, being able to express yourself um, and and one of the litmus tests that I used to have for somebody who I thought could be a good product manager even was can can they write and and it was it was wild to me when I started moving up in in businesses and I was like wow this the C suite doesn't know how to write <laughs> they they don't know how to use contractions um, and it was it was. It was mind opening, but uh, being able to write and express yourself, it you can you can bypass a lot of 
difficult situations if you can say something clearly. And then, of course, being able to communicate, you know, verbally is is really important. Um, so I think those are are really important for for leadership um, in marketing. And then the other thing, and this. Uh, I don't know if, if I can say that this is relationship per se, but we can maybe, maybe it is. Um, I have found, and you've probably seen this, in fact, I know you have, that with the, the golden age of marketing automation systems becoming popular in the you know, 2008 kind of time frame, and um, everyone had to go buy Eloqua or, or you know, Marketo, um, that, that, PE firms and VCs and everybody was so enamored with marketing is now a science. It's all science. All I need to do is find the right return on marketing investment and put money there. And then I don't have to worry about the soft side anymore. And uh, so that, um, that, that kills a lot of the buzz in my mind in marketing um, takes a lot of the fun out of it in my mind in marketing. And, one of the things that I strive to do wherever I work is to to remind people that that real good marketing is a, in my opinion, is a balanced scale, and it's got a balance. And it, half of it is that science side of marketing and conversion metrics, and you know everything we're getting out of our marketing automation tools. But then the other side, this awareness component, which is a lot harder to measure objectively, but is ridiculously important because it's really hard to to move the balance scale down on the demand gen side if you don't have an authentic brand that people are aware of that you're building advocates and evangelists that you know you've got a you've got a bit of a buzz so um it's kind of relationship but uh you know from a marketing perspective i it's kind of the picture that i would paint totally i think the uh, one thing i'd maybe add to it is I think that comes back to marketing being an innovation discipline or should it should be. And I think making it strictly science-based, if you will, uh, takes that, I think it de disincentivizes innovation because all the stuff that, I mean, we as marketing leaders know can have a major impact is notoriously hard to measure, right? Yeah. Like, heck, this podcast we're recording right now could do all sorts of things, right? I, uh, not least of which is I might get some sort of insight out of this conversation that allows us to change how we, uh, whatever, target CMOs or something. Not, you know, not that I'm trying to do that, but it could happen, right? And how do you assign a value to it? You can't. So... But on the flip side, because you can't, then it's like, well, why are we doing the podcast? We can't accurately measure the full value that comes out of it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, there's some solutions to it. I'm not, we don't need to dive into that yeah. conversation. But I think it's that in, those incentives for innovation, I think, are so important in marketing. I I completely agree with you. I mean, it, and it makes me think of something that uh, another marketing friend of mine who's a CMO here in Austin. Um, he's posted that up on LinkedIn and I thought it was, you might actually know him. Do you know Russ Summers? Uh, not not inter- formally. I'll, I don't know if we've ever like talked, but I know of him and all that. Yeah. I'll introduce you to him if you're ever interested. Um, yeah. Uh, backstory, he and I met playing acoustic guitar at a little bar called the Chicago House here in uh, in Austin. But uh He's done amazing things and he's, he's a provocateur, I would say on LinkedIn. And so he posted this post that was, it, it talked about how risk needs to be a component of your go-to-market strategy. Mm-hmm. And he gave some good examples like chat GPT. They weren't the first AI uh, driven tool the, you know, Jasper and uh, writer, they were good tools, but they they, they didn't take risk. They were more traditional. You had to pay. Um, they didn't open it up to everybody. Whereas ChatGPT opened it up and now it's become like the Kleenex of AI. Ditto with uh, Zoom. Um, pre-pandemic, there were lots of, of 
web conference tools that people used. And if you were in business, you knew their names, WebEx and others. Um, but when Zoom decided to give away Zoom to churches and schools, now Zoom is, you know, a household name. So anyway, um, I guess that in retrospect, they can quantify that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely something to consider. Yeah, no, I, that's an, I think I actually saw that post and I love that line of thinking because I, I talk about risk also quite a bit, um, both internally with our team and publicly. And I, I do believe that it's, uh, like I think of marketing like an investment, right? So with an investment, you have to consider your risk reward ratios and all that kind of stuff. Like you're always taking a risk. Nothing is ever guaranteed. Um, so yeah, I totally get that. So I guess maybe let's, let's pull on that thread a little bit. As a marketing leader, you know, you're the CMO, you think that way. How do you, uh, how do you nurture that type of thinking in your team? Well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, lead by example. Um, first boss that I had that really did that, it was, it was eye-opening for me. Like, oh my gosh, like I'm this junior level person, but he's doing the exact same thing that I would do and probably working harder and, you know, all that. So what does that look like? If you can share that, that's like a specific example working with him or her. Um, well, in that case, I was a sailing instructor. <laughs> it was a summer job in college and he, I was whatever I was 20 years old and he's this grown man and he's lugging sailboats up and down from the beach, even though he could have just sat in the air conditioned little room and told all of us kids to do it, you know, but, uh, but then I paid attention and I paid attention in, in jobs going forward. And, uh, for, for me, um, as, uh, as the marketing leader, like I'm in, in a lot of jobs, I've been probably the, the guy at the UPS store with the trade show materials, dropping it off at six thirty you know, as often as anybody else kind of a deal. Um, I'm not afraid to write any content. In fact, I like it. Um, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, this is what I think is really important. Um, another way to, to, I would say institutionalize that kind of thinking and even beyond a marketing leader is in an area that, um, people might roll their eyes. And then if you would ask me like 10, 15 years ago, I'd have rolled my ass too, but it's around uh, establishing real good core values for your organization. And kind of the example that I think back on is, uh, is I, I, it's like, I say, you know, live your core values, don't carve them in stone. And the reason that I say that is I work for this big telecommunications company that some people, some, I don't know who they were in the company came up with these core values. They carved them into, they said they were river rocks, but they were these big rocks and they gave one to everybody in the company and we all had them on our desk. But I promise you, there wasn't a single person in the company who knew what those core values were, even though they were carved in a rock and sitting on their desk. Um, flip that and um, you're you're probably familiar with uh, with traction or EOS as a you know a way to run businesses. So I worked for my first company that used EOS. I started there back in uh, 2017 or so, and uh, I was skeptical when I when I went before I started. They said, "Here, read this book," and I was like, "Oh my gosh, not not another business book." But this is just really practical and pragmatic, and uh, the the core values that were established before I got there. Um, it was eye opening how we 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 walked the talk as a leadership team. We created a Slack channel so that people could give each other core value shout outs. Each of the core values had a icon and it was always plugged into the Slack channel, you know. And and it was real. It was visceral. And so I have uh, taken it upon myself to steal that every time I've gone somewhere else. And now three more times since then, I've worked with leadership teams to articulate core values. Um, I always remind them that you can't make them up. They're there or they're not. And aspirational core values, I think are ridiculous in my opinion. So what you do is you do an archeology span experiment, you see what's there, you dust it off, and then you 
presented in a way that makes sense at hover um we came up with well I, a little more on that um at hover before i became the full-time cmo i was a fractional cmo and i came in to do some consulting and i asked the ceo kind of at the outset so have you articulated your core values and and he said, yeah, we've got that. That shouldn't be hard to get down on paper. And then I talked to some more people and it turned out there were like eight core values, you know, that different people would say at different times. So we uh, distilled those down and we came up with the Hubber Path, P-A-T-H. It's always nice to have an acronym so people can remember it. Um, it's uh, it's proactive and prepared. It's, uh, it's uh, accountable, transparent, and harmonized execution with kind of work-life balance talk about it all the time, you know, the hover path. And if the leadership team, like, and, and you really have to hire by it, measure by it, fire by it, you know, the whole nine yards, and then it becomes a real part of the culture. And that's a, it's a great way to lead by example, I guess is a very long winded way to come back to your, to your question. Yeah. That, it's interesting. Like as an employee a long time ago, I always thought, core values are just complete BS. And it's very possible thinking back on those experiences as we're talking, it's probably because it was more of that, that river rock example than what we're talking about now. It was like, oh yeah, here's this poster, put it on your cubicle, have fun. Yep. Right. And then nobody remembers them. Nobody really talks about them. Nobody lives by them. They're just there because somebody somewhere decided, somebody in HR probably decided we needed them. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and right now, like we just went through a big exercise and where we put together like the what Gabby and we now call uh, the culture pyramid. Gabby, my co-founder and wife for anybody who doesn't know, mm -hmm. husband and wife team over here. So it's a whole pyramid of the core values are at the bottom and then there's operating principles and leadership principles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, going all the way up to our owner's intent because uh, obviously we are owner owner led and owned and whatnot. So um, I, until we did that and we got the feedback from the team and whatnot, and we, I, I, one of the things you said really resonated with me personally, it's, you know, aspirational values are ridiculous. One of the pieces of feedback we got when we presented this to the team and we, they were all involved in the process too, which made a difference um, was, Hey, you know what? We, these are not just, it's, this is not just an aspirational poster. This is like real stuff that we already do. Um, so I to totally resonates everything you're saying. Um, you know, kind of going back to, I want to try to dig a little more on the risk aspect uh, specifically. Because um, I think risk it, for most people, I would say, has a very negative connotation. It's risk is scary, right? And I, and I think in any job, and I think, in marketing, especially if we think about like the environment we're in right now, where there's layoffs and tighter economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, people are, I would say probably fairly so like scared of making a mistake, right? Um, but as you mentioned, as we talked about, risk is a big part of doing good marketing and understanding risk. Um, I'm curious on like, how do you, or what have you done to train your team or teach your team to evaluate risk as it comes to, as it pertains to marketing specifically? It's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I, so I, I told you I started Xerox and uh, it was interesting. They were, this was back in, I started in 1990. And so they were, trying to well they were in that point recapturing market share because they had gotten lazy and gotten kind of their lunch was eaten by the um by the offshore manufacturers and so they did something that even i'm, I'm impressed with myself looking back as like a 22 or 23 year old guy new to business they had this thing called the total satisfaction guarantee and we this was in the days before an internet right and so it was like printed on parchment paper and we stuck it in our pitch book and we would go share that with folks. Um, but what it was, was exactly that. Like you buy this copy machine from us and you don't like it, then we'll take it back. You know, we'll give you money back. And um, 
nobody really ever took us up on it because we bent over backwards to make sure that once we sold it and we installed it, it was all good. Um, and so then I carried that forward many times through my marketing career, particularly like I can think back to my telecommunications days. And, you know, if, 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 if AT&T, MCI, Sprint, you know, WorldCom, Level 3, whatever, they're all selling kind of the same, call it an internet access service, right? They started competing on the service level agreement. Like ours is going to be 99.5% uptime. Well, no, ours is going to be 99.59. And so what, what I used to say to folks who would get really nervous about it was, you know, this is, this is an actuarial experiment, right? But we're not going to do the math. We're going to, to an extent, with marketing, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. But the upside that can come from building that goodwill, um, you know, it's, it's huge. And then an, another time, um, this is also in product management, there was a solution that people could buy back then where, I don't want to get super technical, but uh, back in the day before everything was virtual, you bought like physical private line connections. And this, the way that they were sold was, was basically per mile, you paid a certain, uh, you know, amount and everybody sold it that way. But there was this one kind of solution that we decided to price at a flat rate. And we took the actuarial risk that it was going to work out. And because it was different, people were like, really, I can just buy it that way. It's so easy. And, and from that point forward, another Jamieism kind of took hold that I have never let go, which is you have to strive to make your product easy to buy and easy to sell. And, uh, you know, it was easy for our salespeople to sell. We used to call it the wedge product because it would get us into like huge companies and be like, really, I can do that. That's easy. And then the next thing you know, we'd sell them a ton of stuff. So, um, I just rambled. I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, no, I, I think, think, risk I think is you key. did. <laughs> um, you, you gave a good example, and I, I'm curious. In that example, where you switched to that flat rate, did you do some even like back and napkin math? We did. So the way that the way that that one worked was it was you've heard of a T1, which is a certain amount of bandwidth, and a T3, which contains a certain number of T1s. And this was like a hub and spoke deal, and so we said, well, if everybody if someone in Dallas only had locations in, you know, California and New York and Maine and Miami, yeah, we're going to lose money, but that's probably not going to happen. And it turned out that because it was a flat rate, people would buy it and they would only use like half of the number of T1s that they even needed, you know? Um, but it was such an attractive offer that they couldn't stop themselves. Uh, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah. And I mean, the reason I asked that question is because, the way I like to approach it, what I try to kind of instill in in, uh, in our team, in my team, is like just most of this like risk assessment stuff can be very very simple, and you can do it on literally on the back of a napkin. Like um, as an example, we were talking to I was talking to one of my uh, like our director of growth, uh, and um, we we're talking about a prospective customer or somebody he knows that he's going to have a meeting with. And I'm like, Hey, look, they're probably going to be too small for our pricing model. And here's why. And he's like, well, what do you mean? And I can, I'm like, look, let's just do very basic back a napkin. We can see that they got, you know, X amount of dollars in seed funding recently, no funding since uh, we can see how many people they have based on their, uh, the number of people they have and the types of jobs they are. It's mostly engineering. I could probably guess it's somewhere between 100 and 150 K per person, especially if you include executives, et cetera. So you can do the basic math and say, this is their annual comp cost, right? And you can say, fine, they're obviously getting some revenue. Like they don't have a ton of runway. They're not going to spend 300 K on a marketing vendor. Not very likely. Not, not on services, like plus media yep. and all this kind of stuff. Like talk to them, but don't chase it. Like you can just like, and it's like, like that, cause that's, a, that's a risk, right? So like as an example, and I think it's a lot of these things are like that, right? Like what you just described. It's well, let's see, what's the worst that could happen? And what's the likelihood of that happening? Probably not very high. Okay, cool. Let's just do it. And you can always kill it if it, if it's not working pretty quickly. Exactly. That's, that's the other thing is instilling in the people that, 
I hate to drop like an agile term, but like let's do an MVP and you know and and then don't do it if it doesn't work out. But you'll never know if you don't try. I, I'm trying to remember I, there who it was. I don't think it's Drucker, but so there's a like a decision making framework that I remember reading or hearing about ages ago, and it's like uh, one of the criteria is how reversible is this decision? Like when you're thinking about your risk, right? Like, can you just turn this off? Yes. Okay. Well, that's pretty easy. Then the worst, then the worst downside is whatever we get wrong in that period. And that's it. And then you walk and think, and then you're done. Yep. Um, now people can do some dumb marketing things that, 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 uh, you know, anti-brand things or silly things and, I can't say some of those here because it will be documented for posterity, but you know, but for the most part, the dumb things that a company does are outside of marketing. And remember in the, in the dawn of social media, when people realize that you don't own your brand anymore. And uh, if you, you know, you send a technician out to someone's house and they fall asleep on their couch or, you know, somebody videos your, your baggage handlers tossing luggage, like, like a basketball, like, that's going to get out and people are going to find out. So, yeah, um, we're, yep. we're pretty, we're pretty smart in marketing compared to some of those other departments. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Um, any, um, I guess if, if we think about uh, skill sets as far as, and I'm just going to keep pulling on this risk thread. Cause I do think, I think it's an important one. Um, what are the skill sets that I think that a marketing leader needs to have to be able to do that? To be able to take risk. Um, I, 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 I talk about this a lot. Um, and I'm not saying everybody has to follow the path that I did, obviously, but the path that I took, I think helped me because I started in sales and in sales, a lot of people are going to say no. <laughs> you're going to you're going to lock knock on a lot of doors, and you're going to build up some emotional calluses. I think uh, that is conducive to being able to take risk later. And then, um, and what I always say there is that my time in sales helped me be like genuinely empathetic to the customer. Like you have to kind of mind melt to to be able to be to be good at sales and consultative and all that kind of stuff. And then. Uh, in product, I kind of took the empathy thing again and I said, you know, hey, salespeople, I know it's really hard to be in sales. So I'm going to try to make a product that's easy to buy and easy to sell for you guys. So that because I sat on, you know, that side of the table before. And then as um, I moved into marketing leadership, I try, I, it's kind of like you have to have a 360 empathy, right? You still have to be empathetic for sales because you know, they're a big customer and you're trying to make their lives better. Um, you also have to be though empathetic to like the, the entire company. And that's where the whole culture thing has gotten so important to me. And that's, um, that's the core values, you know, like being the driver of core values, um, oftentimes, and then also trying to be the driver of articulating things like a real core focus or an elevator pitch, depending on what you want to call it. Um, because I've just been, I've seen so many times, like at the same telecom company where they carved the core values in the river rocks are, there was a PR firm that did an experiment and they called each of the like seven people on the leadership team and asked them for like the company's like elevator pitch. And they got seven and completely different answers. So since since then, when I started a new leadership role, I kind of try to do something that I call like Operation Mother-in-Law, which is, hey, if you're ever at a at a family reunion and your mother-in-law says, hey, Jamie, what does Hover Data do? You know, that everyone in the company should have a similar kind of a story that they tell. Um, uh, so I, we did implement a core focus at Hover. I've done that in several other places. Um, try to make sure that everybody's on the same page with what the whatever you want to call them, uniques or differentiators or distinctive competencies so that everybody's kind of saying the same thing. Um, and I would say that that's to your risk question. That's kind of like mitigating risk. Those are like 
pitfalls that I know your people will step into if, if you don't get out in front of it and give them something easy that they can understand. And then again, walk the talk and iterate, and iterate, and iterate. Um, in terms of taking risks and, and for marketing leaders, I mean, this, you're going to, this is going to come down every year when you try to get a budget approved. And so, um, if you can quantify what you did, it makes it easier. And that's not always, as we talked about earlier, it's not always, Mike, if you and I can figure out a way that we can quantify um, awareness and across like 8 million different measures, I think that would be pretty, pretty cool. But it's hard, can't yet, at least I can't. Um, and so one of the things that I do, and, and again, this comes from my background in sales, I always say that sort of the net net result of what I want to do with my marketing team is to, to drive opportunities that are going to turn into revenue, you know, nothing new. And it's a little bit easier to measure it now, but it, it makes spending money on marketing budget easier for CFOs and CEOs when they know that that's my goal. I might not always get there, but it's what I'm always going to be trying to do at the end of the day. Not to take us too far off topic, one of the things that we're, we're actually we're, we're working on figuring out a different way to to measure. Uh, and one of the things that's at the top end of that is focusing on affinity over awareness. So the, I guess the way I think about it is like awareness is broad, right? Like, sure, I, I can have a, a million people that are aware that my company exists. Who cares? What I care about is the thousand people who have an affinity to my company, whether they're gonna buy from me or not. Because if they don't buy, they're more likely to recommend. If they do buy, great. And there's gonna be even more likely to recommend probably. At least that's the goal of, you know, yeah. of the rest of the things that we do. Um, so I think we're, we're actually focused on measuring affinity rather than awareness because aware, awareness gets money, right? It's like, well, is that impressions? I mean, I can buy impressions, mm -hmm. right? Is it like, what, what is awareness? I think even, even defining that we're like, and yeah, we have like problem aware, solution aware. And I think those are valuable things, but at the end of the day, at some point you have to build affinity. And like, to me, like that's step one, it's not even just awareness. I completely agree with you. And uh, so I, I wrote it down. I'm going to take that away from this conversation. Um, sure. But but yeah, man, um, I'm sure that you're thinking about the variables that go into your affinity equation. So do you, have an off, do you have an off-the-shelf solution that you can just buy and plug in? Not, not, not as of right now. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. We're, that, that's something that w once we put this all together, I think that's that's something we're kicking around. But that that's a that's probably like a V three, I would guess at this point. Well, something to buy that you think is out there, or something that you would build. Oh no, something that we would build because I don't uh, I don't think there's at some point it's going to be like a some sort of proprietary algo or or something that yeah. that looks at specific factors because again, a lot of these are. Um, correlations i would say that i haven't seen anybody consistently look at or um or any tools that actually measure them in this way like uh i know you know like as an example would be um you know uh, fact like creating an affinity score almost and factoring in okay yes click the rate is important let's just say but what's the quality of that traffic Right. Or what's the quality of the views? How can we, can we correlate that to, uh, you know, branded traffic, direct traffic, referral volume? Like there's all sorts of stuff that we're looking at. Those are just some of them. Um, so anyway. All right. When you're ready to do it. Um, I don't want to turn this into a conversation about what we're doing. But, let's talk. Um, let's talk though. Cause I'm, I'm very curious about that. Sounds good. Happy uh, to. Help. Happy to. Um, uh, you know, it, since we're talking, uh, we're talking about risk. Um, 
I love that you mentioned mitig- risk mitigation because I think, again, that is such a that's such a critical component because again, I feel like when people think about risk, they again they just think about the bad stuff. It's like, oh, well, what if this happens? Okay, great. Now that we have identified what are those things, how do we mitigate? Is like, can we test it with a smaller audience size? Can we create an out clause in our contract? Can we like you know whatever like. What are the things both from a marketing and I think that's the other thing too is are there non-marketing things we can do, just other business things that mitigate the marketing risk? Could be contractual, could be whatever, right? Um, it's like that. I love that you brought up the the risk mitigation thing. Um, yeah. So we talked about talked about mindsets, talked about skill sets. Um, let's talk tools. You mentioned a few already, but um, again, if we can stick with this risk assessment and mitigation thread, as because mo- I find that one interesting, what are the tools that uh, marketing leaders need? And again, well, I use I the word tools very, very broadly. That's no, that's fair. I mentioned the the a, a racy doc or whatever you want to call it, just something so you know who's doing what, where, with whom to whom, whatever, so that then there's, you know, you're mitigating risk there because then there's no surprises and ideally stuff should get done. It's going to get done. Where do you, um, uh, you know, one thing, one thing I'm curious about, cause we have one and the feedback we've gotten from our team at least is like, well, yeah, I, we know we have it, but it's, it's a lot. There's like, you know, I don't know how many lines on it, whatever. What have you done? I'm curious to, both make it maybe more visible, right? So people don't need to search for it maybe or make it simpler. I'd love to hear that from a more tactical perspective on the RACI. That's a great point. Um, And I don't have a really easy answer. Um, I've worked in places where we've distilled it, well, specifically in the company that did business process management. Part of the tool actually created what was called an accountability chart and we would go like imagine an org chart that you can tr- drill down on so um you know you start with the ceo and then the ceo's direct reports and you click on say jamie the cmo and then you can see my direct reports in north america and my direct reports in EMEA, and then you can kind of see you know next to me my accountabilities and then you know for everybody on the team so was it, it just focused on accountabilities or did it look at kind of the things you're also responsible and need to be consulted on and all those other things? No, it, we, we had to kind of distill it down because it would have just gotten, it would have gotten too big there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, but at the very least, what it did is it gave the whole company an easy way to figure out who to call if they needed something because, Hey, you know, Jamie's and, and, and in a, in a lot of cases, accountable and responsible kind of get mixed to get, you know, mm-hmm. and they're kind of saying the similar, depending on how you look at it. So, Hey, Jamie's accountable, responsible for whatever um, PR. So, mm-hmm. uh oh, we need we got a PR thing. We're going to call Jamie. I like that because, and I wonder, like, for somebody you know, for either smaller organizations or just any company that doesn't have a business process management tool, how can you make that come to life? Like, could you add a, I don't know something to like, a, I don't know if Slack allows you to add like custom fields maybe or something like your accountability field or something. So somebody can easily look at what you're accountable for. But I, the general concept I like in terms of how can you make like the, a, a short list of accountabilities for each person public? Cause obviously it's in the job description, but who looks at job descriptions on a consistent basis? No, no, you're right. And it, it's rare to get that cross company. Like I've in, I've had, I've been in multiple places since that business process management gig and I make it in like a PowerPoint slide, you know, <laughs> and I, so that I can share it with my team and like, okay, here's what we all do. And, um, but it's not public. It's a, it's a really good point. So, uh, you mentioned accountability chart. Um, any other tools, uh, that are tools to mitigate risk. Yeah. So, or to mitigate or, or allow people to take risk, um, you know, in product management, it, it was, you know, 
the complex business cases. Um, and even trying to do that, you, you get to feel good when you see the, you know, the end of your pivot table spits out a positive net present value, but then um, it doesn't always work out that way. So to your point earlier, I, some of the better things we've done have been um, less calculations than that. Um, I think that, and you know, maybe this is, we're talking tools. So maybe marketing now we have an embarrassment of tools um, and I am a fan of a cohesive you know, set of um, a marketing engine, um, combining a CRM and a marketing automation tool and plugging it into some kind of data source and making sure that all the integrations are in place because as you've probably seen when you work with clients, it's probably nine times out of 10, they're spending way too much money on tools and they're not even connected and they're not using them. So um, you can get into trouble with that. Jamie, you're going to make um, me cry. I'm dealing with that on, my, on our own side right now, not just on marketing, just tools in general. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Um, it's the whole people process and technology thing, right? It's too easy to focus on the technology. And if you don't have the process and the people, and... yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've seen companies get in trouble when they didn't have the their the the tracking of emails in a CRM set appropriately, and then uh oh, more people have visibility in these emails than they should, and then people, get, you know, there's just all number of things that can happen. So I, I think that the tools are great. Um, I think they help you mitigate risk because you can do things like A/B tests pretty easily. You can look, you know, measure the results pretty quickly. Um, but you just got to make sure you're using them right or else you're opening up a whole nother can of worms. Um, other tools. I'm sure as soon as we stop talking, I'll think of 10, <laughs> but I can't think of any. Right now. No, I mean, that, that, that's a good list. And again, it's, uh, I use the word tools fairly loosely because there's the technology side, but I, I think of process as a tool. Um, and, and all that kind of stuff. So it is. Uh, there's no, no no doubt about it. It's a tool. I think you've I think you've shared a lot a lot of great things. I've taken some notes. Uh, actually, one little thing I wrote down um, that might be interesting to others is you you mentioned having a a specific icon uh, for each core value. Uh, I actually really like that because it's to me it's these little things I feel like that can make a big difference, and I think it's that simplicity of like just easily being able to recognize what it is. Cause we do the same thing that you mentioned is we have a, like a kudos and shout outs channel, which by the way, I think I mentioned, I just did another interview a little more than an hour ago now. And same thing came up, kudos and shout outs are important, et cetera, et cetera. So it's definitely a yeah. trend and I, and I agree with it, but we, you mentioned something specific in this core value icons thing. I think we're going to, I'm going to talk to Gabby and see if we can, if we can do that, create some custom, core values icons. Cause I, th I do believe it's, is there an easy way to tag it or make it visible and make people accept, Oh, this is the, whatever the, I don't know, the core value bear. I don't know something. Yeah. Right. That someone knows what it is. Well, a hundred percent. And so looking behind you at your, your logo on the back of your door right there. Um, it's when you're making your, your, your icons for your core values, if they're going to live in Slack or whatever your chat tool is, Make them big and bold like that because if you try to get too fancy, you can't read them. I yep. learned that from experience. Yep. So we, we do have, we have a, we have the logo uh, emoji or whatever. So that exists, but that's just general. Um, yep. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Jamie, thank you for everything you've shared. Let's uh, go to the lightning round, shall we? <laughs> I didn't know there was a lightning round. Oh, did I forget to prep you? I uh, it's nothing to worry I'm about. I'm nervous. Nothing to worry about. These are right. mostly fun questions. Um so question number one in the lightning round. What's the main KPI you use to evaluate marketing success? I'm gonna have to go with um uh, since I my my underlying kind of drive is always to for revenue. Um, opportunities to turn into revenue, that's that's going to be the one for me. All right. What is something new you're looking forward to testing out this year? It's probably going to be incorporating AI into workflows. 
Interesting. Do you have any, uh, I know this must be rapid fire, but since you brought, we brought up AI here, any, either anything you've tested out so far or anything that you're thinking where it could fit? Uh, at a, um, I'm also, in addition to right now being this, the full-time CMO at Hover, I've got some marketing advisory stuff that I do on the side. And one of my clients is working with uh, an offshore content writing firm. And the more that I review that content and end up spending hours editing that content, it occurred to me that, hey, I'm going to do an A-B test and I'm the same prompt that they're given to write about. Um, I'm going to dump that into some tools and see what I get out of there because I might be able to save a lot of time and money. Um, so just pra pragmatic things like that to yeah. start with. It's interesting. There's somebody I just uh, remember who it was, but somebody that I'm connected with on LinkedIn, uh, I think it was Brooklyn Nash because he runs a content, uh, content firm. Uh, and I think they did a test like that where they did – prompt for the AI, a prompt for some sort of offshore talent and a prompt for same prompt for like their, you know, skilled uh, copywriters. And I think they did a test like that. I don't know how extensive it was, but it might be something interesting for you to look into. Yeah. I want, I want to know how his results worked out. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. What is a marketing quote unquote best practice that you really hate and you think needs to go by the wayside? <laughs> Uh, I said it earlier, it's, it's trying to value, to understand the value of your marketing team just by the conversion metrics. And, um, even I should say, even by the, uh, the opportunities that turn into revenue, because oftentimes there's timing and there's a lot more that goes into it. Definitely. Um, what is your least favorite business word or phrase? Hmm. Something that's like nails on a chalkboard for you. Yeah. Um, there, there, there's a lot, but I'm not, I'm going to abstain just in case I say one that's uh, <laughs> somebody that I, that I work with a lot. All right. All right. I never thought about that, but that's, that's a good point. <laughs> um, don't want to offend anybody. What is your favorite business or marketing book? Oh man. I, I've read some good Peter Drucker stuff, um, but I'll I'll say this just because we talked about it before. I'll say that uh, if if you're in a startup, I think that Traction is a is a really good book to get to get familiar with. All right, um, one that's a little bit more fun, if you will, um, especially since you're a music guy. What is your favorite song or playlist to listen to while at work? I can't listen to music while I work. No? I do, it doesn't. It doesn't I, I, Even instrumental? Things, you, I don't listen to anything when I work. Oh. It's weird. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll put a plug for myself in, though. I just released my latest EP on Spotify. So if any of Sweet. you guys want to go listen to something, check out sure. Jerry uh, third, uh Send me a link, and I'll, uh, we'll put it in the show notes. All right, cool. Fun. Awesome. Well, Jamie, that's the end of the lightning round. Like I said, pretty painless. So thank you for sharing all your insight. This has been fun. It's been great. Hopefully you had a good time. And for everybody else, we will see you next week. Thanks. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Master Marketer Show. We'll be back next week with more B2B marketing success stories. Visit our website, www.proofpoint.marketing, for the full episode library complete with show notes, guides, templates, and more. Make sure to follow Proofpoint Marketing on LinkedIn and YouTube so you never miss an episode. Listen every Wednesday wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time.